thank you. And at the at the end of Father Spitzer's talk, uh, you you can write down questions at any time on file cards that have been provided, and uh, people uh, will come up and down the aisles collecting those, and then we'll bring them up and give them to Father Spitzer. There'll be plenty of time for question and answer at the end of his formal talk. Oh, let me say a few things about Father Spitzer. He is an internationally renowned and admired Catholic leader. He was president of Gonzaga University from 1998 to 2009, where he significantly increased the programs and curricula in faith, ethics, service, and leadership and he led efforts to build 20 new facilities, increase the student population by 75%, and raise more than $200 million for scholarships and capital projects. That's a remarkable accomplishment, and I know something about the way Father Spitzer, uh, his tenure as president at Gonzaga, and he did wonderful things for, the, uh, for its central mission of focusing on faith in Christ and bringing that to the students. He's currently the president of the Magis Center, whose mission is to restore, reconstruct, and revitalize belief in God, the transcendent dignity of every human person, the significance of virtue, the higher levels of happiness, love and freedom, and the real presence of Jesus Christ. His TV appearances have included being on Larry King Live, including debating Stephen Hawking, the Today Show, where he debated the topic of euthanasia, the History Channel, in a program called God and the Universe, a PBS series called Closer to the Truth, and the Hugh Hewitt Radio Show. He currently appears weekly on EWTN uh, television, in a show properly called Father Spitzer's Universe. Besides hundreds of presentations to colleges and universities, Father Spitzer has spoken to Tony Blair's cabinet in London, officials of the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia, both sides of the conflict in Northern Ireland, government officials in El Salvador, and numerous other hotspots where he has been asked to speak and to intervene. In 1989, he received Georgetown University's Edward Bunn Award for Most Outstanding Professor at the University. In 1997, repeat, Seattle University's Award for Most Outstanding Professor. In 2009, he was awarded Gonzaga University's highest honor the Desmet Medal. Currently, he's working on a project I'd like to tell you something about. It's called CredibleCatholic.com. It and can be accessed that way, CredibleCatholic.com. This is a program, the motivation for which was 42% of young Catholics are leaving the faith. 50% of that number are leaving because they don't think that the faith can reconcile, can be reconciled to science, that it's either science or faith, but not both. Father Spitzer is dedicated to showing that the two are compatible. So this, this curriculum, CredibleCatholic.com, is aimed at middle schools and high schools. And uh, Father Spitzer, how, how far has it been disseminated already? Okay, so 116 out of 192 dioceses in the United States and the whole country of Ireland, it's reached uh, many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of young people already with more to come. So it's not that uh, we can do nothing. Uh, Father Spitzer exemplifies that something can be done. He's also published 10 books and numerous articles on the human person, leadership in business, happiness, and science and Christian faith, a topic on which he is particularly famous. And as Jeannie Buck, I mentioned, he will be speaking in this auditorium tomorrow night at 730. 
Well, Father Spitzer has a way of taking complex ideas and making them understandable. And he is the kind of leader that the church, the educational institutions, especially the university, and the larger society need. So please welcome Father Robert Spitzer. Thank you so much, Phil, for that very generous introduction. Professor Legut, uh, Legutko, I, I just want to thank you for a, a truly excellent talk. Uh, prescient, challenging, clear, and quite humorous. I, uh, I really enjoyed it immensely. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and give at least a part of a solution. Uh, who knows whether the solution really exists. It's a tr truully a, a juggernaut. A, and indeed a Gordian knot uh, that we face uh, in liberalism and especially um, its uh, almost stranglehold over culture. I think I'm just going to go right back to the Christian apologists, St. Ignatius of Antioch and company, who began to emerge <clears throat> in the Roman Empire and um, see the solution that might exist uh, for restoring the strong gods. I, I think um, uh, R.R. Reno's uh, book there, uh, the, the Return of the Strong Gods, which um, Professor Legutko uh, outlined very precisely, uh, is a good place to start. Uh, remember what he just said about those strong gods. Yes, it's religion, it's transcendence, uh, it's objective metaphysics, that's really important. Objective morality. And these things, of course, have in them a hierarchy. There's also some objective dimensions and rankings of powers within human beings, so like Plato's tri tripartite soul and, and Aristotle's ranking of happiness. More on that in a moment. But these are the strong gods. And the strong gods, alas, are hierarchies and, of course, the weak gods have been blended into a kind of, well, a mush, uh, in, in a way. And um, uh, there's nothing that stands out. There's nothing that directs the human person. There's nothing that gives instruction. There's nothing that says this part of you is higher than that part of you. This part of society is higher than that part of society. The hierarchies have gone. But how? How to restore them? When there is a juggernaut of what might be called liberalism, a juggernaut of what might be called uh, um, uh, the, the, the weak gods that is manifest in the society. Here's what I glean from Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, I mean, obviously, he paid the price in martyrdom for bringing out his nasty little hierarchies and his religion and his gods. However, his god, I should say, no, no S. However, in the syncretism of, of Rome, and Rome after all, if you really want uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate sort of syncretistic uh, culture uh, combined with autocracy, uh, a real totalitarianism, Rome's a great example. And yet the Christians in 300 years kind of reached around the corner and grabbed it. And uh, they did it because, of course, God intervened. So the first thing I just want to say is, We've got grace on our side, ladies and gentlemen, and we should not forget this. God can even influence Constantine to make the Christian religion the religion of Rome. And by the way, he does a lot of other things in history that I just can't go into right now. Where you just you were you look at history and you go. I mean, who could have gotten up in the morning and, and just you know, looked at the situation and not despaired? And yet, a few years later, the entire situation is turned around and people are just scratching their heads and going, how did that happen exactly? So we do have grace on our side and we shouldn't despair, but we have to invoke that Ignatian motto. And the Ignatian motto is this. Work as if everything depends on you. 
and pray as if everything depends on God. And you'll get there. We don't want to say, I prayed to God, my work is done. And we don't want to say, I'm working real hard. God, let me handle it. Both things are a recipe, in my view, for suicide and the sure victory uh, of what might be called an autocratic liberalism. So um, where to begin? What did the Christians do? They returned to rationality. Oh, yes, they prayed. But they became rational apologists. That's what they did. And, of course, in this democracy that we have, with all of the freedoms that we have, there is still one thing that's really respected, and that seems to be reason. Science has such a, you know, a, a huge prestige in our culture precisely because reason, empirical, rational reasoning, empirical, mathematical reasoning still enjoys a prestige, <clears throat> a prestige, I might add, and I'll be talking a lot more about tomorrow, which is really appreciated in our culture and which I think Christianity can use to its advantage to restore what Reno would call the strong gods. The hierarchies, the really objective metaphysics, the objective hierarchical moral order, etc. I think we can use science to our best advantage, reason to our best advantage. And I'm going to suggest that this is a partial solution. There are other things that we have to do besides pray and invoke reason. And I've, I'm going to give you a sample of, of, of a way that I have had a lot of success uh, in using to bring the strong gods, to bring metaphysics, religion, transcendence, etc., back into the form and into the fore in a culture that is trying to push uh, the hierarchy down uh, to a single level. So um, I'll give that in a moment. But I think we have to remember, you know, something that my uh, old metaphysics professor, Paul Weiss, once said, you can never allow any government or any attempt at consensus to try and blend society with the state and to blend culture with politics. They're different animals. They do different things. The state has power, but culture, that has the influence on the inner soul. Both the inner soul of individuals and the inner soul, if we might put it this way, of the collective society. Culture is about animating the spirit. Culture is about creating an ethos which lifts people up and calls them to virtue, to heroes, to the higher things, to what Reno might call the strong gods, to what we would call the one God, and all of the metaphysical pursuits and objective moral pursuits that Christianity uh, you know, has, has defined around itself. So we don't want to make culture and politics synonymous. Political people should do what political people are supposed to do. They should provide social uh, services. They should provide protection. They should provide the governmental services that are required. But they should stay out of the new think business. They should stay out of the cultural conformity business. Culture ought to be determined from within, not by a police force, not by, uh, you know, pure, uh, you know, batting down people whose ideas you don't like. Culture ought to be determined by, first of all, the beliefs of people, and of course, a rational underpinning of those beliefs to try and get to the most amount of, of uh, synthesis that we can, not by taking out differences and hierarchies, but instead by trying, in some sense, to use rational means to find out what really is truly right for the human person. Truly good, not only for the human person, but truly good for the collective uh, of humanity 
and is truly good in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the Creator, in the eyes of the Redeemer. That's what we have to do, is I believe, bring rationality to the form. I think that's what, uh, what Christianity did. But Christianity formed a culture independent of the polis. Later, when Constantine came along, yes, the two became one. But Christianity was busy forming a culture. And they not only formed a culture with reason, they formed a culture with love as well. Remember that Christianity starts and, and gets its cultural influence by serving people educationally, in, in health care, and in, in social welfare. And of course, to this day, the Catholic Church is still the largest healthcare institution internationally. It's still the largest public education system internationally. It's still the, the largest um, uh, public welfare system internationally. I mean, the statistics are overwhelmingly show that about 26% of all such facilities are still under the Catholic Church in one form or another. And that's because they had an ethos of attending to the needs of people along with a really sublime, rational justification of it that depended upon the interior of human experience, all of St. Augustine's confessions, yet at the same time, great systematic philosophy, all of St. Thomas Aquinas, but so many others that preceded them. So let's just uh, take a look at the first thing that we have to think about is prayer counts. The second thing that really matters in, in the creation of a culture is, is that we be rational, but that we also be charitable at the same time. That that ethos of Christ, uh, you know, that sh should prevail. A and this will slowly but surely allow the idea of God and grace uh, to, to again uh, repopulate the culture so that politics just simply can't take it over and eclipse it and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, bring force to bear, to push God out or to push uh, you know, reason out and to push the strong gods of metaphysics and, and objective morality and transcendence uh, out of, of the proverbial stage. The, the second thing, uh, you know, Paul Weiss indicated was you really shouldn't collapse society into the state. Society, that's the group of people that exist through a culture. We're in a society here. Uh, the, the, there's a society in the United States, but it's not reducible to the state. The society has a, a, a variety of not just ideas, but beliefs and strong beliefs, rationally justified beliefs. And that's grounded in turn in our sense of worship. It's grounded in turn in our sense of, of you know, the various powers of the soul. The society is giving us some direction upon where our soul is to go. We're not just physicalist, embodied beings. We do have souls that empathize with one another. We do have souls that have a conscience that can perceive morality and can be formed in morality. We, we have uh, you know, uh, the, the desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. A desire to be in communion with God. A desire for transcendence. An amazement at transcendence. The sacred, the beautiful, in that sense, the majestic. We've got a soul that can't be reduced to mere embodiment and physical processes. Why, you know, right today, you know, David Chalmers in this hard problem of consciousness can't even come close to explaining processes like our inner subjectivity and our self-consciousness. Uh, you know, there's a great book that he's, he's, he's written on this, uh, just showing that physical processes, in any way you configure them, will not be able to, to explain those powers of the soul, which I'll be talking about in a moment, empathy and conscience, etc. So my point is, that's society. Society, that's the group of us here, speaking about ideas. And yes, debating ideas. And having ideas that we think are better or worse than others. For rational reasons, better or worse. Or because we can perceive that some of those ideas will lead to disaster and dehumanization, whereas other ones will lift up the human soul and enable us to progress. 
But whatever it is, we ought to be using our minds to determine a hierarchy of what's best, the very thing that animates Aristotle at the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics, where he basically is talking, he's trying to say, look, we want to know where to go in life. What's the good life? Don't tell me there's no such thing as good. I shouldn't call them, you know, what I've discerned as good and, and, and other people have discerned as less good. If you have good rational grounds, said Aristotle, why not? We don't want to remain in perpetual ignorance brought down by the lowest common denominator. We want to use our minds to elevate ourselves. And boy, when St. Thomas Aquinas and the, 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 the Christian world discovered Aristotle, I don't mean this in any kind of a... Uh, you know, a heretical sense, but they baptized him in a sense. I mean, essentially, they wanted that rational synthesis where St. Augustine brought the rationality of Plato and, and the soul of Plato right into the heart of Jesus' revelation. So also Aquinas uh, did this um, uh, with Aristotle. But it was always the genius of, of, of in my view, of the Christian church. It was always the genius of Christians to bring together mind, rationality, reason. Today we say science to bring it together with revelation, with religion, with Jesus' revelation specifically of how we ought to not only conduct our lives, but the path to eternal salvation in him. So that was our genius, and I think it may be a partial solution to how to get out of the, the juggernaut of what might be called liberalism. I'm just going to go to this chart here for just a second. Uh, some of you have heard me refer to this in, in past talks. Um, I have a book out called Finding True Happiness. I'm not giving you a shameless ad for the book. Um, you can get a lot of this book by simply going to CredibleCatholic.com and just clicking on uh, the big book, Volume 13. Free. But if you want to buy the book, please do. What's my point? My point is Aristotle made a statement a long time ago, which I think provides a key to getting us out of the juggernaut of liberalism. What is it? He said, happiness is the one thing you can choose for itself. Everything else is chosen for the sake of happiness. This is a mere rational statement. Aristotle's trying to say, what I glean from my experience and my study of humanity is this. We all want to be happy. It's the one thing we can choose for itself. And my definition of that one word, happiness, is going to determine the kind of friends I'm going to make, the kind of spouse I would, uh, would have chosen if I hadn't become a priest, the kind of job that I will pursue or the career that I will pursue. It'll determine the way I judge myself, uh, my, judge my life. Am I going somewhere or am I not going somewhere? Am I life worth something? Is my life not worth something? Et cetera, et cetera. It's going to determine everything, said Aristotle. That little word, word clicking around in the back of our minds is so powerful. It can put any political regime and any liberal juggernaut to shame. That's how powerful it is in the individual mind and heart, said Aristotle. And not only that, it's powerful too in the collection of human beings. You know, when St. Thomas Aquinas wrote his treatise on happiness and uh, uh, both in the Summa Contra Gentilis and in the Summa Theologica, he kind of starts the whole, you know, ethical treatment, the treatment of virtues, everything else. It all starts with happiness. And St. Augustine's confession, dare I say it, um, he puts it uh, four different words for happiness throughout the confessions. He begins with low-level happiness, like Lytus, right? Mere pleasure-seeking. He then goes right to uh, uh, Felix, uh, which is kind of a, uh, ego comparative happiness. He, he then goes to um, uh, Beatus, who it, or Beatitudo, right? Beatus, which is uh, uh, the kind of happiness that comes from contribution and virtue. And finally, the kind of happiness that comes from being uh, united with God, sublimitas or gaude. But the, the key point for St. Augustine as he's going through, he sees that there's these different kinds of happiness connected to different parts of our being. 
And I think this is completely valid today. And I think it supersedes a lot of psychoanalytic paradigms. And the reason I do is because psychoanalytic paradigms, like you take the Maslowian paradigm, or, or, you know, or uh, you know, other really excellent paradigms, when it comes down to level three and level four that I'll describe, when it comes down to getting close to the powers of the soul that are transcendent and moral, it starts having trouble because a psychoanalytic paradigm generally re is grounded in an empirical methodology. And so the powers of the soul that are a little higher, empathy, conscience, and, and, and uh, you know, the desire uh, to, to move beyond myself, or transcendence, the desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, to be connected with God, the amazement at, at the sacred, etc. All of these things are hard to grasp in a mere psychoanalytic paradigm. I think it's much better just to go back for a second and study those powers of the soul. So just let me go through this chart for just one second. Level one, by the way, notice this right from the beginning. It's a hierarchy. <laughs> it's one of those bad boys, as Professor Legutko might say. And of course, it, it, it is a hierarchy, but it's based on reason. It's a rational hierarchy. It's Plato's and Aristotle's rational hierarchy. It says, the happiness which is most pervasive, enduring, and deep is the highest. That's the best. That's the direction you ought to go. For no other reason than don't you want to make the most difference with your life that you can? Or well, why wouldn't you want the, most, the, the, the happiness that gives you the most pervasive effect? Don't you want to be as happy as you can for as long as you can? Of course, for merely rational reasons. Why wouldn't you want to be happy in the most enduring way? Not just the most pervasive way, the most enduring way. But why wouldn't you? How about deep? You, don't you want to be happy in a way where you can make real contributions, the real high-end quality creative contributions with your mind, your moral power, your ability for ideals, your empathies and loves, your transcendence and spiritual life? Don't you want to make a high? Or do you just want to in, invent a better spaghetti? I mean, I like spaghetti. Don't get me wrong. The point I'm trying to get to is, of course, as Plato says, it's natural. Aristotle says, it's natural. You want something that's more pervasive, more enduring, more deep, or that is to say, more, higher quality, with your time, with your energy. As the old slogan goes, you only go around once in this world. You may as well go <coughs> with pervasive, enduring, and deep, rather than shallow, superficial, and stupid. So... Having said that, let's go through the hierarchy, um, the rational hierarchy here, level one. That's the lowest. That comes from merely sensual pleasure or merely material aggrandizement. What does it mean? Bob Spitzer sees the bowl of linguine, smells it, lunges toward it, wolfs it down, and goes yum. He becomes happy. But it would be a mistake if Bob Spitzer lived for Linguini alone. Not only would it mean that I'd be more overweight than I already am, but there'd be the opposite consequence of a wasted, uh, uh, the uh, uh, alternative consequence of a wasted life. Secondly, uh, we've got level two, and that's called ego comparative happiness. By the by, 71% of our culture is dominant ego comparative. Who is achieving more? Who is achieving less? What does it mean? I mean, I get an ego jolt when I focus the locus of control on me. That's good. And that involves a comparison. Somebody comes up and says, Spitzer, you are an incredible chess player and you have achieved much. And I say, Please keep talking about this uh, topic. I'm very interested. <laughs> of course, it makes me happy, but again, in a rather superficial way. But no question, 71% of our culture 
is, is fixed on ego comparative happiness. Who's achieving more? Who's achieving less? Who's got more power? Who's got less power? Who's got more status? Who's got less status? Who's more popular? Who's less popular? Who's more intelligent? Who's less intelligent? Who's more athletic? Certainly not me. Who's less athletic? Who's, you know, and you could go right through every character. Who's more beautiful? Who's less beautiful? Who went to the, I, I just read so-and-so's Facebook. Who went to the best parties? Who went to the late, no parties, et cetera? Who's a winner and who's a proverbial loser? <clears throat> the point, of course, is clear. What we're dealing with in, the, in, in this situation is mere ego comparative status seeking, um, which does bring you some ego jolts, no question about it. But at the end of the day, as St. Augustine discovered so beautifully in his confessions, it will leave you empty indeed because your nature will never be fulfilled. You were created for much more than that. You don't have to appeal, uh, as you're making your rational case, to the obvious Judeo-Christian claim that we are made in the image and likeness of God, which we are. But if you want to make the claim in the, in the public square, if you want to make the, uh, the claim in the, in the civil domain, you might want to just say, you know, I think I've got something more to me than just mere ego comparative identity. And I'll get to what will manifest this in a moment. But we're going to a higher level of happiness still. Contributive happiness. This is the kind of happiness that comes from the opposite way of achieving level two. Remember, level two shifts the locus of control to me. Level three is investing me in the good of people and, and processes outside of me. So I want to make a contribution to somebody or something, some ideal, some good beyond myself. Um, typically, this is portrayed by a, a person getting to 80 years old and going, hmm, what was the difference between the value of my life and that of a rock? And they have to go, well, the rock probably made more difference to culture and to society and to the people around me than I did. That would be incipient despair. And we would feel it in the, just in the grips of our souls. We would feel it. We would know that we were, in some sense, uh, beneath ourselves. We were caught up in a Kafka-esque sort of a, of a thing, you know, and or his final words, you know, he's dying there and he goes, like a dog. You know, I just wasted everything. I just went down like a mere beast. Well, the point I'm trying to get to is, yeah, we do need to make a difference. We don't want to get to 80 years old and figure out that we did nothing. Our lives really didn't make a difference. So there's another kind of happiness. When we're making an optimal positive difference to the people around us, we're making an optimal positive, positive difference to our family, to our friends, to our community, to our church, to the kingdom of God. We're making an optimal positive difference even to the society or to the culture if we're so lucky. I mean, uh, Professor Lagutko is very lucky. He's got uh, influence in the culture in so many different ways. And so all these things, when we look at, you know, what can I do to make an optimal positive difference before I leave this world? So that my life was not just wasted, but my life was invested in making the world a better place for my having lived. According to the talents I've been given, the energy I've been given, the, the opportunities I've been given. Yeah, we all live situationally, but we all have the opportunity to make a difference to family, to friends, etc. But there's even a fourth level of happiness, a higher one still, that we need, to, to, you know, that, that requires fulfillment. And that's transcendence. Don't worry, I'm going to get to the rational case, not only for why we ought to pursue these kinds of happiness, the higher levels, but how the lower levels can destroy us. That's where we can make the case. That's where we can bring this hierarchy back in. And along, it's not just a hierarchy of happiness here. We're bringing in strong gods all over the place. We're bringing in, right from the, the top of the line there, transcendence and God. That's level four, and I'll talk about it in a moment. And level three, we're bringing in not just contribution, but of course we have to do it in a way that's virtuous. Otherwise, it'll just undermine the, the very good we're trying to do. 
and there's some real difficulties with living for level one and level two alone. Now, is, is level two okay? Sure, level two is good. Ego comparative happiness will give me some self-esteem. It'll give me some strength when I'm debating people who don't agree with me, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'll be able to stand up strongly. And that's a good thing. Self-esteem is a good thing. Competitiveness is a good thing. The seeking of excellence is a good thing. But not when you make it an end in itself. If you join the Mensa Society and you're 80 years old and you go, you know, I had a better IQ than 99.9% .9 of the world. The rest of these guys are just a bunch of sops. But I, I was the guy with the 200 IQ who did nothing for anyone ever. Obviously, incipient despair, once again, is not enough to be the great God. We need to make a difference with the gifts that we have. So level four, we're little ultimatizers. Let me put it that way. I'm doing this from the vantage point of the secular case. I can tell you Jesus would agree that God is the highest. Right? Remember, when he's asked what's the highest of all the virtues of all the commandments, he says, First, right, uh, right away, Shema, Yisrael, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the, the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength. The second is like it, so he elevates it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you can see the priority of level uh, four here, of faith in God, but it, we can make a rational case for this. We have a yearning for God in two different ways. The first way is we have a desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, and we will be satisfied with nothing less. I mean, my little nieces, you, you, they, they want perfect truth. They'll come up and they'll go, Uncle Bobby, well, why is this? I'll say, oh, because of that. Well, why is that? Well, because of that. Why is that? And finally, you have to go time out because you're in the deepest modes of quantum theory. And they're like, <laughs> they're literally like little exoset missiles. They're just going to keep going and keep going and keep going because they know I didn't give them the complete set of correct answers to the complete set of questions. I have not yet answered their desire for perfect truth. The whole thing, the complete set of correct answers, the complete set of questions. That's what they want until they grow jaded. But in the meantime, they want it. And that's in the human spirit. They not only want that, they want perfect love. I once had a student at Georgetown, he tells me, he says, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I don't want perfect love. I, I, I'm more realistic than that. He's one of my good physics students. Anyway, he comes up, he says, uh, I'm more realistic than that. I said, oh, well, that's good. So I, you never had a girlfriend that really, you know, just kind of got tired of, you know, she's always disappointing you. She was never perfect home for you. She was never perfect meaning in life. She was never perfect understanding of you. Never perfect response to you. She was always exemplifying merely human things, like she'd get stressed, make mistakes, and even get tired. And you just finally said, you know, I've had it. She's not the one. And he goes, oh, I did that about last month. And I said, well, Steve, what were you looking for? Perfect love? <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah, but you're looking for it in all the wrong places. It's God who's perfect love, that poor woman, you know? I mean, you're trying to extract divinity out of her, and she's not there yet. The point I'm trying to get to is, of course we want perfect love. And we want perfect goodness and, and, and justice. If we didn't want perfect goodness and justice, why are you all here today? We're looking for a better, more just, more, a, a, a better society. Of course, we're searching constantly. Why, why do we have people who are so disappointed with the order of things? The legal order is, 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 is just not just. And it's not. It's, it's not perfectly just. Why is it that a little 10-year-old child, for the, when he first discovers for the, you know, that his parents are not perfectly just or right for the first time, and he's so outraged that he just screams out, that's not fair, with his lower lip extended in pure outrage. How could you disappoint me? You're not God. I've got your imperfections down. They know. 
Little kids know perfect judgment. They know, they know perfect love. They can tell authenticity. They know perfect truth that when you haven't gotten it, they're just like us. They can recognize imperfections in truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home all the time. I'm not at home here. That's not beautiful enough. There's a pimple on my face. Whatever it is, the point is, we want these things. And that's a sign of God. Because God alone is perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. And you would never be able to endlessly recognize all the imperfections in truth. All, and, and ask another question. All the imperfections in love and quest for more. All the imperfections in justice and good and quest for more. All the imperfections in beauty and try to improve it. All the imperfections in your home and try to make it even better. You'd never do it unless you, were, you had a sense of what perfect truth, justice, beauty, goodness, and home would be like. If you didn't know what perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home is, would be like, you'd never endlessly recognize the imperfections. You would be free. The apple could have dropped on Newton's head, and like a cow, he would have picked it up and eaten it. <laughs> Point I'm trying to get to is, we're different. When animals run out of biological opportunities and danger, here's a strong God coming. I'm going to make a difference between the animal kingdom and you. When animals, this is the truth, when animals run out of biological opportunities and dangers, when you no longer pet them, that's a biological opportunity of affection. You no longer feed them, the biological opportunity of, of, of getting sustenance. You no longer threaten them, the biological danger. When animals run out of biological opportunities and dangers, they slip out of their state of conation and into a state of slumber and fall asleep. Human beings don't do that. When we run out of biological opportunities and dangers, we think about the questions we have not yet answered and are curious about. We think about the loves that could be better and we don't have them. We think about the justice and, and good that we didn't get and we are basically stewing and brewing and that's not fair, etc. We are actually looking for greater truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. Animals don't do this. You little ultimatizers, you. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get to is this. This hierarchy is perfectly justified. But there's a second level on which we yearn for God. We yearn for communion of, uh, with God, not just through perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. We want those, yes. And God is it, so we want God. But more than that, we want God himself as the perfect interpersonal, interrelatable being of, of true love and empathy, of, of true goodness and, and purity. We want to be in connection with God, not just as creator, but with the one who truly is the one that will, who will call us to himself. We have a sense of that. We have a sense of reverence in, this, in our instinctive awareness of sacredness. We absolutely have this sense and we want a connection with God. Let me just pause for a moment and give you the results. I'll tell you how much we need God. Don't for a moment think that we do not want a connection with God and need desperately a connection with God. Has everybody noticed what's been going on in, in the, 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 the surveys uh, very recently, uh, that were published, first of all, by the National um, um, uh, Center for Disease Control on suicides. In the last 15 years, there has been in this culture a 51% increase in the, in the rate of suicides. 51% increase. By the way, we are going to exceed Europe. We ought to be worried about this. Our suicide rate among young people's millennials and Gen Z's is out of control. And by the way, 46% increase, according to the latest Columbia University study, 46% increase in depression in the last 15 years, same period, among the same group, millennials and Gen Z's. So, uh, like, what are we dealing with here? What's the cause of all of this? Well, I could venture a, a, a correlation but then I have five studies to prove it. I think it correlates with the Pew study that uh, Phil Rolnick, uh, Dr. Rolnick just mentioned. And that is that 42% of our kids are leaving 
not just the Catholic Church, but at the mean age of 13, they are going to make a decision that they want to leave faith in God altogether. 42%. As Phil just mentioned, 50% of that 42%, so 21% of our Catholic kids going to church right now will do so because of faith and science. They don't think there's enough evidence for God. Um, um, and, and so they, they think that science and, and faith are contradictory. Science is truth, therefore faith must be a fantasy. Please, if that is of concern to you, come to my lecture in this hall tomorrow night at 7.30. I will give you enough evidence to give these kids pause for more than thought. I think some real initial affirmations, but I, I digress. My point is, this is going on. Just watch this, 51% increase in suicides. Now we see the 46% increase in depression. We see a downturn of 42% um, you know, in, in belief in God and among millennials and Gen Zs, the same group we're talking about, I'm beginning to notice a correlation. But you can say, aha, post hoc ergo propter hoc, Spitzer, you forced a correlation into a causation. Ah, but I have other studies in my little quiver. And here they are. <laughs> Number one, there is the Dervick study of 2004. If you have not read this 2004 Dervick study, she is from the American Psychiatric Association. It was a really good uh, longitudinal study with 10 authors. You can, oh, by the way, it's all free of charge. You just go to put uh, Kanita Dervick, uh, suicides, non-religious affiliation. Just put that into your Google, bing, you'll get the, the whole study right there. What did she notice? By the way, she did a very careful study, she and her colleagues, because uh, basically they took out anybody who had been clinically depressed formerly, et cetera, right? So if you have a history of clinical depression, you're not in the study, et cetera. So educational levels, same on both the non-religiously affiliated side, the religiously affiliated side. Economic level, same on non-religiously affiliated, religiously affiliated side. So basically she's got a really good study here. What did she find? There are significant, this, we're talking about non-religiously affiliated people. So they are a nun, according to the Pew survey, N-O-N-E. They have no religion uh, uh, to speak of and no religious affiliation, no desire for one. What did she discover? Non-religiously affiliated people had significantly higher, really significantly higher rates of depression, impulsivity, aggressivity, Substance abuse, familial tensions, and suicides, including suicidal ideation. That has been confirmed by five other studies. I'll send all the studies to Dr. Rolnick. If you want those studies, I would say I'd click on those studies. Uh, about three out of the five studies are um, on the internet. Read them. Because I think what they verify is people who don't have religion are not just unhappier. They are really just a shadow of themselves. They are what Mircea Eliade long ago called the tragedy of non-religious man. Uh, Eliade, one of the great philosophers of religion, uh, was one time you know, saying what happened to people uh, you know, when, they, when they lost their religion. And you know, he didn't have the big surveys like we have today, the, the Dervic survey, et cetera. But what he did notice is that people would literally fall apart, like some part of their nature, even the most ultimate part of their nature, the highest part of their nature was unfulfilled. Everything that Dr. Legutko talked about, that, you know, the dissipation of the hierarchies, everything that Reno talks about in, 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 in you know, the loss of the higher gods, you know, it, it's here present is that you, you can see you lose this hierarchy, you lose God, you, you lose your ultimate ontological or metaphysical grounding with ultimacy, namely God. You lose an objective sense of morality. You are going to be in despair. And I don't mean incipient despair. I mean depression, impulsivity, aggressivity, substance abuse, familial tension, suicidal ideation, suicides, etc. That's what you're going to be in. And it's pretty serious stuff because our culture is going down that line. 
Now, if God exists, and I think there's more than enough evidence to, to substantiate this from science and from reason, I think that's very true. Come tomorrow night if you want more. Uh, one thing, though, I would say, though, is if God exists and we are not paying attention to what's going on in our hearts, namely that the origin of our desire for God is God himself, why would we desire God? unless God was present to us. Why is it that we would desire God if God, how could we be aware of God enough to desire him if somehow we didn't have a sense of him to begin with? Was this just communicated to us by some empty ritual? No, religious rituals are not empty. They're filled with meaning and significance, as Eliade says, that goes right back to our interior disposition of being. It's God's presence to us that makes us aware of him enough to desire him and to want to be in communion with him. He's the one inviting us into communion. Augustine discovered this, by the way, in, 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 in the Confessions in Book 5 a long time ago. It's God's presence to us that makes us, that's calling us within and making his, himself known. And that's why we yearn for him. And that's why when we ignore him, when we don't practice religion, when we don't do anything, that's why we are so sad. But anyway, yes, we are ultimatizers. We look for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home because God is present to us as perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. And, and we yearn for communion with him because God is present to us. He's inside of us. He's inviting us. He's calling us. And we couldn't even have the desire for him were it not for his presence to us. You're not going to get the, the awareness of God by looking around and seeing water bottles and microphones and all kinds of things in the empirical world. And you're not going to get a desire for God by merely physical processes and your algorithmically finite physical brains. You're going to get it from God. A cause commensurate with the effect. If you're desiring perfect truth, I'm going to say that, that, that perfect truth is present to you. If, you. if you recognize every imperfection of truth endlessly, you already have an awareness of perfect truth. And where did you get that from? You've got to get it from a cause commensurate with the effect with perfect truth itself. God's present. He's calling us. Okay. There's a strong God. But I think we can make a rational case for this. And, and, and uh, again, go to that website, CredibleCatholic.com. You can get the, the case for this right there. Let's go quickly to what's wrong with our culture, too. I mean, obviously, I think liberalism is, is, is a bad trend. This, the, the, truly, the juggernautic, uh, uh, if I can coin a word, uh, is a suppression of, of uh, freedoms. Uh, and, and suppression especially of, of hierarchies, the strong gods, metaphysics, the objective moral order. I think that suppressing those things out of existence is going to kill us. It's going to kill our spirit. It's going to kill the spirit of not just the West. It's going to kill the spirit of the world. It's, it's coming. But it, more than that, I think there's even much more concrete manifestations of what happens when we don't have any level three or level four in our lives. When we get rid of those strong gods, we get rid of contributive identity and, we, and, and, and the moral order, level three. And when we get rid of level four, transcendent identity and faith in God and communion with God, if we get rid of those two levels, all we've got left is level one and level two. And you can see where the problems are going to begin. So let's just take a look at a big old problem called the comparison gate for just one second. But you guys kind of got the, the, the point on the four levels, right? Right? Yeah. So let's go to the comparison gate. What happens when you take level three and level four out of the picture? What happens when you take objective morality, you take contribution, you take God, you take religion out of the picture? You got level one, material and sensual pleasure. You got that left, which we're really good at in this culture. And you got level two, ego comparative. And that's what you got. Now, here's the problem in a nutshell. If all you got is material, sensual, and um, uh, ego comparative success. If that's all you've got, then you've only got three parts to your worldview. Win, lose, and draw. That's all you have. If you're a winner, well, I'll talk about it. Let's say, let's start with losing. 
If you have a dominant level one and two identity, don't lose. Because if you lose, you're not only going to have inferiority, you're not only going to have depression, you're not only going to have ego sensitivities to the max, you're not only going to feel judged every time you walk down the corridor, you're going to be jealous as all get out, and you're going to try and make everybody pay for it. Really, don't think that's not behind a lot of criminal behavior that's going on right now in this culture. It's one big fat case of jealousy of people who have more because the only thing around is level one and level two. And they got a better hand than I do. I can't get out of it. I think I'm going to take back what rightfully belongs to me that you got from your privilege. I'm not kidding. I think criminal behavior arises out of it. But let's get to whatever you do. Don't lose, right? Can you, can you win the game? Can you, can you win it? Suppose you really are the most intelligent, the most athletic, the most successful. You've got uh, uh, you know, the most power, the most status, the most popularity. You are, you are, you just a winner. Let's suppose you are. So, does that really help you out? No, you can't win that either. First of all, beware of ego sensitivities if you're a winner. I go back to my own youth when I uh, um, was giving a physics talk in, in one of my physics classes in high school. And uh, uh, I, I was pronouncing the word spectroscopy as spectroscopy because I'd never heard it pronounced before. I'd read an article on it. And I was talking about uh, you know, spectroscopy as spectroscopy. And this kid comes up to me afterwards and goes, Spencer, that word spectroscopy, you pronounce it spectroscopy three times, and now everybody thinks you're a consummate idiot. I just... <laughs> And I thought of myself as a rather intelligent fellow. So <laughs> I, I was breathless. And, and, and so I went home and I played that tape a hundred times. And then had suicidal feelings. Been there. Done that. Not far from the truth. Now you look at that and you go, you mean a little insult and a thin-skinned kid who invested everything he, he was in level two identity could be brought to the brink of suicide because of something? Yeah. This is all over our culture. The suicide rate among Gen Zs, just to remind you, and millennials up 51% in 15 years. Just saying, something weird's going on. Number two, you just... If, you, if you're a winner, just remember this. You're going to start living for the adulation of others. You're going to want people to come up and go, Spitzer, you are the greatest. Honestly, I am but a mere a nothing compared to, to, to your uh, uh, achievement and genius and so forth and so on. And you get used to the adulation. One day, people get sick and tired of it. And all they want is a little individual dignity and then they withdraw. And your source of meaning in life, you know, you know, when people start going, you're not so great. You're just a, a selfish idiot like the rest of us. And then, of course, they fight back. You have such resentment because, of course, you need that adulation. And the very fact that that adulation is being resisted is causing you horrible anxiety. You know, that, that the Shaler's word for it puts it in French, resentiment. You know, it's just like, you know, a horrible turning out in life. And you're going to make them pay. So what's my point? Ego rage, that's another symptom. Ego blame, it's another symptom. I mean, you're not going to win. You can't win. You can't draw. You can't lose because you're always going to lose. And what's the byproduct of ego comparative and, and central identity alone? Jealousy, fear of failure, fear of loss of esteem, ego rage, ego blame, inferiority, superiority, and everything else practically that makes life absolutely miserable in a society of plenty, in a society of opportunities, and we're miserable. Just telling you. I think it's because we're dominant level one and level two. And there's another symptom that goes along with it. We're empty. If we don't have God, and if we don't have some sense of contributive purpose, 
and some sense of inner character and integrity from virtue. If we lack those three things, ladies and gentlemen, a sense of God, a sense of contributive purpose, I'm making a difference to the world, and some sense of interior integrity and character, I've got some virtues, I've got some principles, I stand for something, I'm not just chopped liver. The moment I get, uh, if I lose those three things, what happens is just pure emptiness. I call it cosmic emptiness, alienation, and loneliness. Where people are literally, sh well, men are shaving in the mirror. Women are brushing their hair, whatever. They're looking at themselves in the mirror and nothing is coming back. They are abjectly empty. And they just don't understand why. They have this terrible feeling in the pit of their stomachs. They'd like to go out and eat two bowls of linguine just to fill up. Or, you know, that cosmic loneliness where they're surrounded by all their family and their friends and they're very prestigious and they've been very successful and everybody loves them and they're thinking, I am so lonely. There's not a single person in this room that can take that loneliness away from me. Something's missing. Or that feeling of cosmic alienation. You're walking down the street and you're saying, I'm out of kilter with everything in this world. It's black and empty and void and, and, and dark out there. And as a matter of fact, I don't fit in. I'm out of kilter with everything. I'm not at home here. That's another way of saying, I'm alienated. On the highest levels. Our culture is filled with this. Back to the Dervic study. Little wonder the decrease in religion, the decrease in virtue identity is leading to cosmic emptiness, alienation, and loneliness. Little wonder we feel r radical increases in depression, fear of, of uh, um, uh, impulsivity, aggressivity, uh, substance abuse, familial tensions, and suicides. We can make a rational case as Christians we make a rational case, not only for level three, but for level four. Now, I've sort of said, why do we, I've already gone through that issue. Why, why is it that we need to, uh, to go to level four? Level three is not going to do it. It's a great start. Uh, I'm not going to, by the way, I'm not going to go through, uh, no, let me just give you two paths to level three. Um, uh, uh, here's our, just, I'm just going to give an outline of a rational case. The first thing you can do, if you want somebody to get out of all that stuff, the terrible things of the comparison game, all I can tell you right now is, here's what you do. You tell them the first thing. Number one, make your own self-manifestation. Make your own manifesto. What is your purpose for a living? Structure it this way. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my family? You don't have to answer all the questions now. Just live for that question. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my friends? Review and live for that question every day. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my community? Live for that question. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my church, to the kingdom of God? Live for that question. How can I make an optimal positive difference to, to the institutions, the organizations, the societal organizations around me? How can I make an optimal positive difference if I'm so lucky to the culture and to the society? How can I do that? If we live for that, if we live for those questions, and at the end of that list of questions, you put this right down there on this sheet, for this I came. The moment you do that, you're going to see the depression start to lift. It won't lift all the way, but it'll start to lift because now you have purpose beyond yourself. Now you have purpose, level three purpose, which is taking the onus off of level one and level two to give you your identity. Jesus Christ was right. Level one and level two are not enough. We need something more. So do that. The first thing, self-manifestation. Second thing that you ought to do, we ought to teach everybody to do, is to look for the good news in people rather than the bad news. Let me tell you what ego comparative identity does to you. If you're, if you, the only thing that matters in life is being better than somebody else, more intelligent, more athletic, more whatever, somebody else, then you'll never want to look for the good news in them. 
all it will do is heap misery upon misery on you. But if you look, if you can break free from having to look for the bad news, if you can break free from the instinctual ability to look for what's irritating, weak, stupid, and unkind in people, if we can break free of that and look for the good news, the little good things that people try to do, the great good things they aspire to do, the fact that they're made in the image and likeness of God, they're deep sea fish, they have transcendental identity, they're looking for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope, they're already in a communion with God, and in addition to that, they've got strengths that I don't have, they've got you know, uh, 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 abilities, they've got gratuitous acts of kindness, delightful idiosyncrasies. There, there's good news in every single human being. If I can look for the good news in them, I can have genuine empathy. And if I can have genuine empathy, then I'm going to care about them. And I'm not wanna, I don't want to take advantage of them. I don't want to do something hateful and terrible that will undermine them and destroy them. I see them as made in the image and likeness of God. Why would I want to do that to anybody? The point is, suddenly, a whole new you know, beginning comes into the mind. Conscience is activated. Empathy is activated. It's good. It's a good thing to look for the good news in the other. It's good to make a self-manifestation. But we have to go more. Level three is not enough. We've got to go to level four. Cosmic emptiness, alienation, and loneliness. So what I was just talking about. We've got to get to, to that. And so we're going to have, or overcome that. We're going to have to overcome the depression of not being in communion with God. What can we do to do that. Number one, you got to participate in a church. I know people don't want to hear this, but it's true. <clears throat> you can't just sit around and think about spirituality in your room. That's not going to do it. Every last one, <clears throat> one of us needs revelation, ladies and gentlemen. If we don't have a revelation, then all we will know about God is what science and reason can determine about God. All we will know about God is what Aristotle could know about God or Einstein could know about God. We won't know the who of God. Oh, yes, if you adhere to Lonergan's proof for God's existence, you will know that there exists an unconditioned, unrestricted, completely unique, entity, reality, that is an unrestricted uh, act of understanding, understanding itself, which is the continuous creator of all else that is in its infinite or unrestricted mind. You can know that by reason, you know. And that's a big what. What God is. You can know that. And you can know from science, by the way, I think you can know that, that there is a, a, a high probability of a creator, not only of every universe, but of, if there indeed is more than one, and every multiverse, if indeed there is a multiverse, as I will explain tomorrow night, you can know that they all have to have a beginning. And you can know that there is a high likelihood of a creator of all those physical entities, and that there will, in consequence, have to be something transuniversal, something transphysical, that's going to have to exist. You can know, you know, from the empirical studies, good empirically based peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences, that there's a very high likelihood that you are going to survive bodily death and a transphysical soul. Come tomorrow night, I'll give you all the evidence in the studies. The point I'm trying to get to, though, is there's a lot we can know from science and a lot we can know from reason. And we can get to some really good, what, say, uh, what uh, uh, Cardinal Newman would call informal inferences. But at the same time, I tell you this right now, um, we don't know the who. We're going to need revelation. And that means we're going to need God to step into human history. And God steps into human history not just to give little Bobby Spitzer his private revelation. God steps into history to give whole communities and indeed the world that revelation. And so you can expect that God's way, and it always has been. You can see this in the history of religions. And Mercia Eliada makes a beautiful case for it. But the point I'm trying to make is God reveals himself to a community. He reveals himself to privileged prophets or priests. And in the case of, of course, Jesus Christ, the Messiah who comes into our midst. But my point is, we need revelation. 
You're going to get it in a church. You're not going to get it just in a private revelation. God's not going to give 50 billion rays of private revelations. He's going to give us the revelation of himself in a way that we can together appropriate. God wants us to be in religious community, to worship together, not just for community support, but to worship together because when we worship together, the combination in our voice is always greater than the sum of the parts because there's something that lifts the spirit in that communal worship that can't be gotten in our rooms by ourselves, etc. So you can expect that God is going to reveal himself in a community. You can expect that this is going to happen. We need a church. We're going to have to go to a church, and the church calls us to accountability. That's okay. Am I short on time? Well, um, that's okay. God will call us to that accountability. And so uh, at the end of the, the day, what can we, can, can we say? you got to participate in that church. you got to submit your will to God through the revelation that he gave, through the church organizations that he gave, we're going to have to participate in those churches in order to get some sense, not only of the revelation, not only some sense of the group lifting of spirit, not only some sense of our interpersonal personhood in, in, in the very moment of worship and religion and, and, and belief, but we're also going to have to have it uh, so that um, uh, we can be ultimately fulfilled. So we need to have a church. And indeed, I believe that Jesus Christ established a church. I certainly think it's the Catholic Church. I, I do think that's the whole commission of Peter is about. You know, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for it is not flesh and blood who has revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And can I talk about why I think the Catholic Church is? Because Jesus says, you know, you are Peter, and upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. And the gates of the nether world will never prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's the, the prime minister's position. That's the second position. The office is second only to the king himself, who is Jesus. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And listen to this. Whatsoever you declare uh, loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatsoever you declare bound on earth will be bound in heaven. I'm going to give you heavenly authority right here on earth. Well, that's written in our scriptures. And all I can say is, if Arnold Toynbee the great uh, historian of civilization and culture is correct, then the Catholic Church has literally outdistanced every single solitary political, religious institution. Its 2,000-year history is utterly baffling to any historian or sociologist of religion. It makes absolutely no sense because it turns out with this vast panoply of all of its governmental and, and hierarchical, hierarchical structures, the Catholic Church is the toughest of any institution that has ever existed, secular or sacred, in world history. Just a thought. This, by the way, comes from a guy who is no friend of Catholicism for most of his life, Arnold Toynbee. My point, my point is, we ought to do some things. Number one, we ought to know that a church is going to be essential to our identity, to our happiness, to our purpose in life, and indeed to our salvation, because we are made for eternal salvation. Number two, we ought to find out which revelation is, 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 the, is the fulfillment of revelation. We ought to be looking for which one we think is best. And we ought to be looking at rational criteria for that, and I think there's a good case to be made for Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Come to the talk tomorrow night on the Shroud of Turin. If you want to see some evidence of the resurrection, that's a real fun talk. Number three, I think a good case can be made even for the Catholic Church. But I'm here I am talking about hierarchies, talking about the best, talking about a non-pluralistic, non-completely level world. There are things to be discriminated. There are hierarchies. There is a best. And it's open to rational discernment. You're free. You can make a choice. Apply rationality to it. Let's get into the public square. Let's debate the issue. But at the same time, we have a responsibility not to run away from the question 
but to ask and answer the question, what do we think is the best you know, manifestation and fulfillment of our transcendent identity? That's a good question. It's okay to say the best. A rational case can be made. Let's make the rational case. Let's just say to the culture, don't try and suppress us. We are but mere uh, agents of trying to apply the best reason that we can to the situation. I think we need to know prayers. And spontaneous prayers are the best way to get started on a prayer life. I'll just say this very quickly. I mean, you don't have to be fancy. You don't have to have Teilhard de Chardin prayers. What you need is help. I give up. You take care of it. That's a good prayer. Or, Lord, make some good come from whatever evil or I, I, I might have caused. Or just simply push back the foreboding. Push back the depression. Push back the darkness. If you say that prayer enough times, he'll do it. I'm not kidding. It happens to me every once in a while. Use the prayer vociferously. My point is, there's a whole bunch of prayers. There's 14 spontaneous prayers. All you need to do is go to majacenter.com, click on the article that says getting started on prayer. Just read it. Just memorize those 14 prayers. They're only little prayers, like help, you know, make some good come out of whatever harm I might have caused, push back the foreboding, thy loving will be done, etc. They're really good prayers. And if you start praying these things, a prayer life is going to start to burgeon. My point, simply, we have to do something about level four. And in this culture, we cannot leave our culture bereft of this hierarchy. If we do, the suicide rate just will continue to climb. People's salvation, in my view, will be jeopardized. The depression rate will continue to, to uh, uh, increase. And we will see at, at the end of the day that our culture is going to implode from within. We need the strong gods. We need the objective metaphysics. We need the, the, the practice of, of religion and transcendence. We need the hierarchies uh, of meaning and purpose in life. We need to face the fact that level one and level two will never be an adequate purpose in life, leaving us empty you know, through, through it all. We need all of these things in our life. If we just simply crush them into a liberal level, non-hierarchical, non-objectively uh, uh, analyzable, uh, uh, you know, um, everybody, it's a free-for-all pluralism. If we do that, we take no responsibility for our culture. As, Dr., as Professor Legutko already said, it's just going to implode the culture from within. The culture is not the same as, as politics. It's a very different animal. You may have the best democratic capitalistic system with all the freedoms guaranteed in place. And as he so articulately manifested, it is very clear that if we don't restore those hierarchies, if we don't restore a morality, if we don't use reason, the thing that Christianity has always used throughout the centuries, always manifested throughout the century, has given us a time and time again, right, the example of how we can bring reason to the fore, science to the fore, then if we don't do this for our culture, I think we will implode. We personally will implode. Our culture will implode. And our democratic capitalism will implode along with the culture because politics alone is a mere empty frame without the volumetric, proportional, wonderful, you know, fullness of, of a high culture, a virtuous culture, a transcendent culture, a religious culture, and a culture that's vibrant with ideas and above all ideals that we fearlessly proclaim that make our life worth living. Thank you so very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father Spitzer. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have questions for Father Spitzer, Oops. anything written down, please get, your, get them out now and we'll collect them and 
Oh, good. I see one coming right away. Sorry. Oh, good. Sorry yeah, about that. I kind of went overboard. I didn't hear anybody what? stop me. <laughs> okay, let's see. How would you respond to those who defend atheism, agnosticism as a path to happiness, the evidence of virtuous atheists? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, um, uh, you can have a, a, a person who has, uh, an atheist who has virtue, no question about that. Um, do I think that atheists are mostly happy people? Well, I just appeal to the surveys. They don't seem to be happy on the whole. Significantly higher rates of depression, impulsivity, aggressivity, substance abuse, familial tensions, and suicides, suicidal ideation. That is generally not the sign of happiness. By the way, um, uh, 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 Professor Legutko referred to, to Sartre, and in, in this particular case, to, uh, I, I refer to Sartre's nausea. Remember what the atheist Sartre said. He, he said, really, if God doesn't exist, then life is absurd. And if life is absurd, then there's only one recourse left, and that's despair. Uh, that wasn't exactly a Christian person. So what I'm trying to say is the idea that atheists are, are really happy people, I would say this. I think atheists can be very happy on level one, two, and three, but they're never going to be able to overcome cosmic emptiness, alienation, and loneliness. And I think it's a terrible thing if we don't debate with them and try to bring them uh, to the point where they can actually see that there is a way of moving beyond the despair and the absurdity that Sartre predicts as an atheist that he himself has and, and other atheists like himself will have. And so I, 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 I kind of dispute that idea of you know, the, the happy atheist. Like I said, happy on level one, two, and three, maybe. You know, can, can uh, uh, an atheist drink a nice uh, bottle of wine along with me? Sure. Can uh, you know, an, an, an atheist say, you know, uh, you know, I've got a lot of ego comparative identity along with Spitzer. Yes, th th that's certainly possible. Uh, can atheists say, you know, I I'm going to make a big difference to, to people beyond myself? Of course, along with me. Of course. But uh, at the end of the day, it's transcendence. It's also the need to, 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 to have that relationship with God and then to take our level three contribution, our desire for contribution, and apply it to our sense of transcendence. It's not good enough just to make a difference for this world alone. Although that's a great thing to do, to feed the hungry, to do great things, to, to aspire, to, to make a difference technologically to a better world. That's a great thing to do. But you also want to contribute to the soul of the world. It's not enough to, consider, to, you know, to contribute to the embodiment or even the collective embodiment or the collective common good in the world. You want to make a difference to the soul of the people out there, to make their souls come alive with a real sense of friendship with God, a real sense of the Gaudi that St. That Augustine talks about you know, in the later books of the Confession, with a real sense of, of kind of that liberation, of, of being in, in touch with a real love that goes beyond the self and, and, and goes toward love itself and goodness itself and truth itself and being itself. And at the end of the day, that gets to eternal salvation as promised by Christ Jesus. I think that too is really important in terms of contributive identity. So I would say atheists can get to a good chunk of level three, but it's going to be really tough for them to get to what I would call level four contributions to make a difference to the soul of somebody, to make a difference to the faith of somebody, to make a difference to the eternal salvation of somebody, to make a difference to the transcendent joy of somebody. That I don't think an atheist can do because they won't acknowledge it. And that's part of uh, Sartre's nausea. That's part of Camus' l'étranger. It's not just the stranger. It's the stranger to the self that Camus is talking about, the alienation of the self, that terrible condition. Can they be virtuous? Yes, atheists absolutely can be virtuous people to the extent that they understand where virtue is really coming from. Now, here is my problem with... Uh, um, a, 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 it's, it's, it's on two levels. Should I just? Okay. Uh, the first level is this. There is a very good study by a guy named Parbatia, and I can give this study to Dr. Roldan, and and he can send it to you. But it's in, of all things, the Journal of Business Ethics. 
this, this guy makes a huge, a comprehensive survey of, you know, do religious people actually act more virtuously than non-religious people? And he, what he says is, you know, atheists and religious people have a pretty good knowledge of virtue, you know, um, pretty equal uh, in, in some cases. They, they have a pretty good equal knowledge of virtue if, if, you, if you're not going to uh, bring in cer certain things like sexual morality and things like that. But they have pretty equal. But what the difference is, Parvati, you notice, is it's at the moment of the decision. Religious people are much more likely to choose to act according to their virtue convictions than people who do not have a sense of God that they're responsible to a moral agency outside of themselves. It's at the very moment of the decision that this occurs. That's in that Parvatiya study. And, and by the way, if somebody has my uh, Finding True Happiness book, I've got it cited in there too. But anyway, so I can send all these studies to you um, uh, along with it. So I would agree in a sense. Atheists can know virtue. They can be happy on uh, two and a half levels, I'd say. But on the, um, on the transcendent side and on the transcendent side of contribution, they're not going to find happiness. And at the moment of making the decision, they're going to be more hard-pressed than the religious person to actually act in, according, in accordance with their um, ethical conviction, according to Parvati. Thank you, Father. Sure. I think, first of all, Father, I want to thank you for the wonderful presentation today. And We're running out of time for questions tonight, but we have people who will, will be in the atrium after we finish here. We'd like okay. to have you maybe meet some more of our friends out there afterwards. Yeah, and Dr. Lagutko and myself are going to be giving a talk, I think, at 7.30. Uh, here, yes, here, right here. Here, and um, maybe that's a time when I could take up other questions yes. uh, uh, later or something. We Actually, we're, we're having a discussion more than Q&A. Yes, and we had a couple of questions this afternoon for Dr. Okay. For Professor Lagutko that we didn't get to. Okay. So maybe we could do both of those things. But thank you very much. Oh, and it was my pleasure. Wonderful. My pleasure to be here.